What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. I was recently looking for a MacBook Pro on eBay. What was it I said in that last video? But we all know you're a cheapskate like me and don't want to buy the real deal. Yeah, well, I'm still a cheapskate because I was trying to find the oldest computer with the best specs I could get. So I had narrowed it down to a 2013 to 2014 uh, 15 inch MacBook Pro. So that's what I started searching for. One thing I noticed in my couple days of searching was that you get either no photos of the item, a really poor description of the item, or a price that's just out of control. So it's like a triangle. You can only pick two of the three. If you want photos and a good description, you're gonna pay a lot. If you want a description and a good price, you're not gonna get photos. If you want a good price and photos, you're not gonna get a good description. So as I'm searching, I know the specs I'm looking for. I wanted a 16 gig model with the discrete graphics. The SSD didn't really matter because I could always upgrade it later with the NVMe adapter. Obviously it needed to be a 15 inch. So as I'm searching, I really can't find any that meet all of these criteria. So I finally come across one that has the right specs and the price wasn't bad. It was listed at $429 with free shipping. So I decided I was gonna go for this one, but the one catch to that, there was no pictures. All there was was stock photos and it said C grade. And in the description it said tested and works. So that's all I knew about the computer was that it had the specs I wanted and it was tested to work. So I decided to bite the bullet and go for it. And a couple days later, this showed up. So how did I do? Well, let's take a look. So when I got the box, I was happy to see it was packed really well and survived the shipping with no problems. In fact, the box was probably a little bit overkill for the size of the computer. Inside, there was just the computer with no accessories. The listing hadn't mentioned whether or not it came with a power adapter, and I was assuming it wouldn't have one, and I was right. The first look at the bottom here was pretty promising. It looked really clean and I didn't notice any major marks, so I was excited to see what the rest of it was going to look like once I flipped it over. Once I did flip it over, I was able to see where that grade C comes from. There were a few very prominent dents on the top and some major scuffs and scratches that for some reason don't pick up well on camera, but believe me, they're there. Taking my first look inside, I was actually surprised to see the keyboard and wrist rest looked pretty nice. The screen on the other hand was gonna need some work. So overall impressions, it's actually not too bad. Considering grade C was the lowest the seller had on their scale, I expected it to be, you know, pretty bad all around. But realistically, this the only thing that's really bad is this uh, top cover here. It's got, I don't know, three or four dents, some pretty serious scuffs and scratches. The screen has that delamination issue that every MacBook from this time period gets. Uh, I'll get some close-up shots of that so you can see what I'm talking about. I have read that it's possible to clean that off using a microfiber towel and like a mouthwash, like Listerine. So I'll give that a shot later and we'll see if we can get that clean. And then that'll be looking pretty good. The keyboard and the uh, wrist rest look really good actually. The keyboard just shows very little wear, just some uh, glossy keycaps, but nothing bad. And the wrist rest is really nice. I don't see anything major about this that would cause concern. The edges actually look pretty good. The bottom is actually in really nice shape. I couldn't find any real major marks down here. So overall, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, just that top cover and I could easily get a skin or one of the um, like clip-on plastic covers Maybe if I didn't want it to look uh, too noticeable with the dents and everything I did fire it up for a minute to check the specs and everything and it is running OS 10 Mavericks Which is what these came from the factory. So it just got reset using the built-in um, system recovery uh, the specs all checked out. It has 16 gigs of memory, an i7 4960HQ, NVIDIA uh, 750M graphics, and 256 SSD. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this up now and take a look at what it looks like inside, see if there's anything noticeable, anything out of the ordinary. Uh, probably clean the fans if needed and replace the thermal paste if it's not too difficult to get to. Okay, just kinda looking it over. So first thing I notice, 
pretty sure that's a possibly a water indicator because it's on both sides. This one's red, this one's white. So there's that. They definitely did not clean those. Those are definitely in need of some air. So other than just being dirty, it seems okay. We're gonna go ahead and clean out the best I can. I did figure since I'm in here and these fans already look so eh, I'm gonna take the heat sink off and uh, repaste it. It doesn't look too difficult. Everything, once you're in it, it's all Torx screws instead of the stupid uh, pentalobe screws. Oh, holy moly, that has a lot of pressure on it. Okay, that actually was simpler than I expected. And as expected, thermal paste is pretty uh, mediocre. So that was super easy to get out. So might as well do it, right? All right, let me track down where my thermal paste is and we'll get this cleaned up. So fans have been cleaned, took them off and blew them out. The heat sink has been cleaned off as well. Processor and graphics chip are both ready to get some new thermal paste and I think we're good to go. Oh yeah, plenty. 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 A little bit more there. And that's it. We now have clean fans and new thermal paste. So now that that's out of the way, I want to tackle the screen. Um, it's hard to see right now, but there are some like blotches on top in the middle. Uh, it just, when the screen's off, it's really noticeable, to, uh, not on camera, but when the screen's on, it's actually not too bad. And I kind of considered leaving it, but there are some lines that kind of go all, all along it. And I'm just not a fan of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can use one of these DIY methods to clean it off. And if I ruin it, that sucks, but at least the screen will smell nice. All right, we have a fresh microfiber towel. That was important. Microfiber, not cotton balls, not uh, anything like that. Poured a little bit of just regular old green Listerine mouthwash in here. People online said to use just a little bit. You're not soaking the screen. You're just, just enough to get it. And we're just gonna, maybe I'll start where it's already. And from what I read, it does take a little bit of a, elbow grease. I've heard people say it took them about 45 minutes or so to do their whole screen. Looks like it might be doing something. All right, I'm gonna keep at this and we'll check back in. So I don't think this is gonna go quick. Two hours. Two hours is what it took to clean this screen. I had to scrub and scrub and scrub. It was crazy hard to get some of the spots off. Some of it came off okay, and I actually thought it was gonna be a lot easier than it ended up being, and other parts just did not wanna budge. So it took a lot of hard work to get it off. But I think it actually looks pretty good now that it's done. Yes, the screen is a little more glossy because that was an anti-reflective coating, but when you're using it, I honestly don't notice it. But you can tell here, like, there's the keyboard reflecting in it. There's the light. But when you're using it, like I said, it looks fine. And if you've got a screen that's really bad with some really blotchy panels and lines and stuff, which I've seen some pretty bad looking screens, this is a viable way to get it looking okay again. So just be prepared to put a little elbow grease in and for it to definitely take some time. So also in that time, I was able to get the OS updated to Mojave, and then I uh, restored my Time Machine backup from my Mac Pro that I use. Uh, and that's actually what the main goal of this computer was, is to replace my 2010 Mac Pro so I can have something that's more portable, I can take my workflow with me if I'm gonna come back here and work on something or if I wanna edit it at my desk. Um, I'm gonna hook it up to a dock of some sort so I can make it as seamless as possible. And since I wanna be replacing the Mac Pro, or at least that's the goal, I decided to run some benchmarks against the two and see how they stack up. 
I ran your standard Cinebench and Geekbench scores just to see. I was gonna do the Final Cut Bruce X uh, render test, but the issue I had with the Hackintosh video where the results were all over the place, I felt like I was getting the same thing here. So any th results I got just don't seem to be relevant or accurate to the actual performance of the computer. First was the Geekbench 5 single core. As you can see here, I compared it to the Hackintosh I recently made as well as the Mac Pro that I use regularly. And it came out on top uh, pretty handily compared to these two machines. So when it comes to the multi-core score, it's a little bit different. You can see here the Hackintosh from 2018 was able to eke out a couple hundred points better than the MacBook Pro from 2013, while the 2010 Mac Pro with six cores is able to keep up pretty good. I think this is due to the six cores just brute forcing their way through the test. The last test was everyone's favorite Cinebench R20. You can see here the scores are actually really close with the MacBook Pro and the Hackintosh only being one point apart while the 2010 Mac Pro with its six core processor manages to eke out almost 100 points better. So speaking of that Hackintosh from my previous video, I think that you know was kind of focused on getting you know the best bang for your buck in terms of performance in Mac OS based on one of these latitudes you could get. I almost feel like this MacBook Pro has almost proved that the Hackintosh laptops at least, we're not talking desktops here, that's a whole different thing, but the Hackintosh laptops aren't actually worth the uh, trouble for the performance you're getting. I mean, to pick up this specific machine right here, uh, you'd end up spending between five and $700 in that range, depending on if you got it new and if you got the specs maxed out like this one is. But at the same time, I can go ahead and get this MacBook Pro, which is gonna offer me, as you saw in those benchmarks, the same or better performance with a more seamless interface with a vastly better trackpad uh, and a better keyboard and a better screen too and it cost me only $430, so it was actually cheaper. And either way, you're gonna be buying used, you're not gonna be getting a warranty on either one. I'm not actually sure it's the best option to go with a Hackintosh laptop if you're buying one, if you didn't already get one cheap or whatever it is. It kind of threw me for a loop there because I've always been in the camp that the Macs are always overpriced no matter what and you're always getting, you know, kind of ripped off for the specs you, you uh, buy. I, I'm actually was a little surprised here because I'm you get a very nice experience with this Mac. I've been using it and it's very enjoyable to use, very smooth and the screen's very nice to look at with the bright colors and the retina, which I used to hate saying that word, by the way, the retina display. And you compare it to this, while this does perform nice, it's very smooth, you have a pretty mediocre trackpad that you have to use an external one to get the full experience. The keyboard's fine. The screen is okay, but it's really nothing compared to this one. And you're stuck dealing with the issues of getting Wi-Fi working um, by either buying an extra uh, separate card or doing like I did with the adapter. Then you still have to install Mac OS on this, which is kind of a pain for people that aren't too uh, tech savvy. So I'm, I can't say that given the options that are available, if you look, I can't say that buying a computer specifically for a Hackintosh is actually viable. Now, obviously the exception to that whole thing is this is a 15 inch while this is more in line with a 13 inch MacBook Pro. And considering this is able to keep up with this, the portability is uh, obviously a factor for some people. I used to think I couldn't handle the 15 inch at all, that's what she said. But now that I've been using it, I actually like it. I think the screen is a good size and it doesn't feel that much bigger. And if you actually compare these two, this is only like an inch smaller on each side. So uh, it really isn't that huge of a difference in size. So I don't think it's something worth giving up if you're getting such good performance. And if you're looking to do actual work on a MacBook Pro, you're probably not looking at the 13 inch seriously anyway. So I guess that's gonna wrap it up for this video. 
Uh, considering I rolled the dice on a sight unseen laptop, I don't think I did too bad. While I didn't get some mint gem, you know, in this whole thing, I definitely didn't get something that was junk and I was able to get the specs I wanted for about a hundred bucks less than what comparable models were going for with detailed pictures and things like that. So if you're willing to take a chance on the just arbitrary grading system and you can check the seller's feedback and get a little confidence, it might be worth something to check out. So if you enjoyed this video, and I hope you did, please make sure to give me a like and a comment below what you thought about the video. And if you're new here, make sure to subscribe. I got more videos in the works, so keep an eye out for that. And until then, I'll see you in the next one.